is everybody starts fresh in IIT. They don't want to hear which school you went to. They don't want to know which college you went to for pre-university. They don't want to know anything. You have to make your own name. That was very liberating because we came from very different backgrounds. Uh, so anybody who tried to show off about their schools and so on immediately were cut down and told uh, you have to earn your own reputation here. That's what I like in IIT. Then uh, my few memories are, I started in Godavari Hostel. In those days, that was about uh, one month when seniors could catch you and kidnap you and take you to their hostels and return you. So we would travel like packs of animals and hoping not to encounter seniors, but once in a while, some of us would get nabbed, but it wasn't as bad as in other places. Then other things I remember were this periodicals. We had periodicals every week, and they will tell you on uh, Friday night on the notice board what the exam was for the next day. And we were all waiting for the thing to come out. It could be in any subject. So once that news came out, we would break up into different groups and somebody like me who knew physics would be leading physics thing. Then we'll go to another guy who knew something else. That's one thing I remember about that. Uh, then uh, I would think my greatest education in IIT was not really in the classroom. It was really with my classmates. Uh, you can see that as time goes by, people from IIT go out and do all kinds of remarkable things. And it has become well known, at least in the US, that it's a great brand to say you come from IIT. It really means something. And it's not due to anything the government did, it's due to what the alumni, what the students did when they graduated. And I've been part of many selection processes in the US, uh, looking at this and looking at that. IIT was a one dimensional selection. You wrote an exam, they added the numbers, you got a single number, and based on the number they admitted you, it looks like very narrow, but they managed to recruit so many talented people. I tell many people it's done as well as, I said, show me another way of admissions that would produce so many world leaders. Uh, then in IIT, I grew by learning to be a public speaker. I wanted to be a public speaker, but my first few attempts were pretty disastrous. Uh, I remember going to Tapti Hostel for a debate and in the middle of the debate, I forgot my speech and I suddenly found myself concluding the speech without even having started it. But I kept doing it because I wanted to be a public speaker. Then I found out for me, what would work is don't quote anybody. Don't quote Gandhi, don't quote anybody. Just talk to your audience. And that worked really well for me, and that worked really well in IIT. The IIT audience uh, was not used to humor in debates. They were actually quite serious, but I introduced the notion of uh, being humorous. In fact, one of my first uh, successes was called a debate on India's salvation lies in the rejection of Gandhian principles. So I said, look, I cannot argue about this till you, till you tell me which Gandhi you're talking about. But Indira Gandhi, there's nothing to talk about in terms of principle. So that was a novel thing and it worked really well. Uh, I was very successful in IIT, but never outside. Only in IIT people went for that kind of talk. And my father was very skeptical that I'm spending all my time doing these things. He said, why don't you focus on your work? But debating has helped me so much in the years after that, because now I'm a professor and I teach, I lecture on my work. And I'm never afraid of a big crowd. In fact, bigger the crowd, happier I am. And that is due to those years spent in IIT. And finally, I think I should mention that after a couple of years, I decided to change into physics. Uh, but my father told me to finish what I started. So I started learning physics myself. And one of my friends called Radha Ram Nityananda, he was an MSc student. He and I would go for walks every day many times a week from Ganga hostel to the gate and back. But each day he will pick some topic in physics and give me an oral lecture. I'll go to my room and I write down my notes and I'll show it to him and basically covered the entire undergraduate syllabus that way. And that's when I ended up uh, going to Berkeley to, to do my PhD work. So that's the IIT chapter.
for everybody, yeah. favorite spot is movie night at the open air theater. I, every time I, now, nowadays I'm coming back to IAT, but I'll return to that, but I always go to the OAT. It's not changed, it remains the same. You take your pillow, you lie on the concrete, and you watch Mickey Mouse or any other movies, right? Okay, so after IIT, I went to Berkeley. I changed my field. I spent five years there. I got my PhD in elementary particle physics, which is the most uh, useless and abstract part of physics. But I said, if I'm going to leave something solid like engineering, let me do something totally useless. And particle physics was the favorite of that field. So I got my PhD there. Uh, then I went to Harvard for three years in what's called the Harvard Society of Fellows. They admit about eight people every year in all fields and they let us do whatever we want. They gave me a room on the Harvard dorm. They gave me a salary. I have dinner with them once a week, and that's it. So that was uh, that was the three years at Harvard. Then I got a job at Yale in the faculty, and I never left Yale. So I've been there ever since. Uh, I like teaching the Yale students. They're wonderful. They're very interactive. Uh, I wrote some books because I like teaching. I like writing books. I recorded some lectures, which are on... YouTube and Yale platforms for students around the world who want to learn basic physics. And it would have been very helpful to me when I was studying in IIT if such things were available, but now they are. So that's one of the things I'm very happy about. Students have evolved a lot from the time I was there. Mm -hmm. uh, they are no longer that passive. Uh, we were told to keep quiet unless we had found something wrong with what the professor was saying. But now we invite them to talk and they talk. Uh, there's no big difference between students in India and students here. Uh, they are now much more active. So when I go to IIT to lecture, I hope they will participate. And maybe in the beginning, they're a little reluctant, but after a while they do. And my host like Rajesh Narayan, who is a physicist, he would ask questions. So the students said, hey, if we can have doubts, we can also have doubts. So they also started asking questions. No, I found, I didn't find much difference. I mean, uh, IIT has become a brand name for fantastic graduate students. Uh, we would admit anybody at Yale who went to IIT without any hesitation. We, in fact, that's a big competition for them. But the physics departments become much bigger from the time I was there. It was mainly a teaching department with very little research. Now it's vibrant. They're doing research in all kinds of areas. Uh, I once got to referee some competitive grants from IIT, and I saw the different areas in which people are working, particle physics, astrophysics, uh, neutrino physics, condensed matter physics, mathematical physics. So it's a great place to visit for me. So I look forward to that. So uh, quantum field theory is, is a long name. It's a way to describe an infinite number of particles, which can be anywhere in the universe, which feel forces between each other. That's the main subject. Uh, it's also consistent with Einstein's principle that whatever one person sees should agree with what another person from another frame of reference will use to describe it. But then in condensed matter physics, which is what I work on now, it's the physics of materials you see every day. For example, superconductors are the domain of condensed matter physics. Here's a question you might ask. If you have a lot of particles called electrons, which have some negative charge, and you measure the resistance, namely you put them between two leads and connect a battery and see how much current you get and measure the resistance, that always decreases with temperature. That's because the medium in which they travel is less agitated as you cool it and the current flows more easily. But then it was found at the turn of the last century that abruptly the resistance drops to zero, not continuously, but suddenly. And that's called the superconducting transition. Now, all it involves is just electrons. We know them very well. We know the forces between them. We know they move in a solid and yet 
the mechanism for this superconducting behavior, it took 50 years for people to solve. In a real solid that is 10 to the power of 23 electrons moving, and you cannot solve it by brute force. So that is the challenge of condensed matter physics. Namely, you know the microscopic particles, you know the forces between them. That doesn't mean you know what they will do when you take a large number of them. It's like people, you may know them individually, but what they will do as a group is sometimes very surprising. That's called collective behavior. And that's kind of things I work on. Books are my lifeline. I think when I'm years from now, I may be remembered more for my books for, than for anything else. So the quantum mechanics book was the first book I wrote. I wrote it because I was at Harvard and I couldn't do much research because things were very difficult at that time. And I said, let me do one thing I'm good at, which is explaining things. So I wrote this book on quantum mechanics. But then for some years after going to Yale, I wrote a book on mathematical methods because students came to Yale without sufficient preparation. And Yale is one of the better universities. In spite of all that, the colleges were moving much far ahead in mathematics than high schools. They always came unprepared. So I wrote a book for that, just the essentials of what they should know. Then uh, many years later, I started teaching uh, introductory physics, which I had not done for many years. These are huge classes, over 100 people, 150 people. And they were not all physics majors. So you have to tell them why physics is interesting. Uh, because you've got somebody in economics or something else. You got to tell them why you find the subject fascinating. And I focused on that. And I realized myself how much I like doing that. So I taught that for some years. And one day the uh, president said, uh, we, we're going to record these lectures. Do you have any objection? I said, no, I have no objection, go ahead and do it. And he said, you realize we will record it as they happen in the classroom. When you screw up, we will have that too. When you tell a joke and they don't laugh, we will have that on tape. I said, that's fine, just do it, create the real Yale experience. So they sent a camera crew. They recorded two of my courses and put them on the Yale website and on, the, on YouTube and iTunes, various places. I think that has made a big difference because about 50 million people have seen those things here, here and especially in China where they show them with Chinese subtitles. Uh, the Chinese have a big uh, interest in the Yale courses. Uh, so then I wrote two books based on those two courses. Someone said, why don't you write a textbook to go with the video because your handwriting is so bad, people would like to know what exactly the equations are. So I wrote two books and they were then translated into Chinese, which is where I, when I went to China to meet the Chinese students. Uh, then the quantum mechanics book was translated into Polish. Uh, these books are gonna be translated into Greek. So they do all kinds of things. Uh, they are all triggered by my desire to teach and to reach as many people as possible. So I don't care how big my audience is. It can be a person sitting next to me in a train or 500 people in the room. I take the same interest in explaining physics to them. And I believe in explaining things so that you're not throwing fancy words at them, but try to communicate at least in spirit what it is you're working with. So that's how, then I finally wrote a book on quantum field theory and condensed matter. And I think I'm pretty much finished. Then my wife thinks that I got at least one more book left inside. So I'll think about that. <laughs>